Good morning, it's Monday the 10th of October and you are watching Ireland AM. We sure are, it's a brand new week and do you know what, Alice? What? Uh, we have got we're in the courses off, sunning ourselves yeah. on our holidays. We've got a brand new presenter with us this morning. Good morning to Kathy Mia. Good, Good morning. morning. Great to have you with us. I'm absolutely delighted to be spending the next couple of mornings with y'all at home. Warren has trusted me to keep her seat nice and cosy while she's off on her vacation. So go easy on me. I'll have fun. I'll have fun. So was that a <laughs> vacation or it's, vacation? See, it's a vacation when a bay is involved. And she is, in course, of course, with her bay. OK, so. OK. <laughs> and tell us, uh, sleep OK <laughs> over the weekend also? Sorted. I'm pretty much a walking zombie right now, but we'll be grand. <laughs> we'll be grand. <laughs> Don't be worrying. Everything is going to be fine. Looking forward <laughs> Great to uh, seeing you over the next uh, couple of hours. Yeah. Great. Coming up, uh, comedy giants and two of Ireland's leading ladies, Panty Bliss and Tara Flynn, join us on the couch after nine. And it's Agatha Christie for Gen Z. We're going to chat to the best-selling author reinventing the mystery novel for a new generation. Now, Katty, what else is coming up on the show? Well, from tackles to tagliatelle, Ireland and Leinster for Devon Toner talks rugby, retirement and the restaurant. Oh, look forward to catching up with Devon later on. But of course, the news over the weekend, it is at the residence of the small Donegal village of Creaslow were left devastated after 10 people lost their lives in a tragic explosion on Friday afternoon. Now, we will be crossing live to Creaslow later, but before that, here's Rob O'Hanrahan with the first news of the morning. Thanks, Alan. Good morning. Technical examinations are expected to continue in Creaslow in County Donegal following a devastating blast in the village on Friday. Ten people died in the explosion, which caused damage to a service station and an apartment block. Gardaí released the names of all 10 victims on Sunday. Eight people are being treated in hospital following what Gardaí are describing as a tragic accident. An investigation into the cause of the blast is now underway, with Garda technical teams due to remain at the scene for a number of days. Well, we can go live to Creasla now, where our reporter Ashling Nikushla joins us. And Ashling, many difficult days ahead there now for the local and wider community. Yes, good morning, Rob. It's been an extremely difficult weekend here for the community in Creesla, especially, I suppose, when the official names were released yesterday of those 10 victims and the photographs to accompany those names, the faces behind the names. It was a really heartbreaking moment here when the enormity of what happened on Friday became very clear. The victims include five-year-old Shauna Garway and her father, and they range from the age of five-year-old Shauna right up to 59-year-old Hugh Kelly. Kelly, with two teenagers included in those victims. Now, the search and rescue operation concluded here on Saturday afternoon when Gardaí were sure that there were no further fatalities and there was no further people unaccounted for. The Garda investigation then commenced, and while they are treating this as a tragic accident, they will continue to investigate over the coming days to try and establish the cause of the explosion. Garda spokesperson Liam Garrity explaining to us what will happen now over the coming days. Well, over the coming hours, days, there will be technical examinations. Again, there may not be the same level of activity that would have been seen during the search and recovery operation, but there will be technical examinations. There will be continuing forensics and, and photography examinations taking place. And as the experts determine what they need to do, we may see other, other activity taking place. But the specific details, I, I can't go into. Um. Now, a number of people are still being treated for their injuries in Letterkenny Hospital, and one man in his 20s is said to be in a critical condition. He's been treated in St. James's Hospital in Dublin. Postmortems will take place now on the bodies of the 10 victims. They will be conducted at Letterkenny Hospital before their remains are returned to the families, who then have a very difficult process over the coming days of organising the funerals for their family members. Ashling, thank you for that. Russia's President Vladimir Putin will hold a Security Council meeting today as Kyiv was rocked by explosions this morning after months of relative calm in the Ukrainian capital. A 19-kilometre-long bridge linking Crimea and mainland Russia was hit with a powerful blast on Saturday. Vladimir Putin labelled the explosion on the bridge in Crimea a terrorist act carried out by Ukrainian special services. While in Kyiv this morning, Mayor Vitaly Klitschko reported explosions in the city's central Shevchenko district. Gardaí are continuing to investigate the circumstances surrounding the death of a woman and her baby in West Dublin. Emergency services were called to the property in Beachfield Court in Clonny on Saturday afternoon, where they discovered the woman in her 40s and her seven-month-old son in the upstairs bedroom. They were both pronounced dead at the scene. 
Gardaí say results of the postmortems will determine the course of the investigation, but at this stage they are not looking for anyone else in connection with the incident. In Thailand, families are preparing for the funerals of the victims of the country's worst ever mass killing. 24 children were amongst 36 people killed after an armed attacker entered a daycare centre in the northeast of the country. Today is the third and final day of a period of national mourning in Thailand, a country united in grief following the worst mass killing in its history. 24 children attending a daycare centre were amongst 36 people who died after an attacker armed with a gun and a knife shattered the lives of a rural community in the northeast of the country. Over the three days of mourning, grief-stricken relatives have been attending ceremonies to remember the victims, including one ceremony held at the daycare centre where the preschoolers were killed, many as they napped. The period of national mourning comes to an end later today, Heartbroken families preparing for the funerals of those killed. The ceremonies are due to get underway in the coming days. Marie Mulcahy, Virgin Media News. And North Korea says its recent barrage of missile launches were tests of its tactical nuclear weapons to hit and wipe out potential South Korean and US targets, according to state media. Two short-range ballistic missiles were fired by North Korea towards its eastern waters on Sunday, its seventh round of weapons tests in just two weeks. It came just hours after the United States and South Korea wrapped up two days of naval drills off the Korean Peninsula's east coast. For car insurance, van insurance or home insurance, call the quote devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. This morning will be cold with plenty of sunshine. There will be scattered showers in the north and it'll be dry elsewhere. Highs of 7 to 11 degrees. And across the day, there will be a mix of cloud and sunny spells. Highs of 12 to 13 degrees this afternoon with moderate westerly winds. Winds lighter in the south. And tonight will be mainly dry with some clear spells, turning cloudy in many parts. Rather calm with breezes easing into a chilly night with lows of 3 to 7 degrees possibly dipping lower locally in the south. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. They're dominated by the tragic explosion in Donegal. Starting with the Irish Times, it's headline, Creaseluck grieves for seven adults and three children killed by blasts. Ten red candles will continue to burn on the altar of St. Michael's Church in Creasla through the week. One for each victim of a huge explosion that partly destroyed a local shop, petrol station and surrounding buildings on Friday. The lives lost, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, neighbours and friends. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The Examiner leads with that story, their headline, A Nightmare of Shock and Horror. We Hold You in Our Hearts is the top story on the Daily Mail. The mayor goes with pray for them. The star leads with smiles we'll never forget. And finally, the herald goes with a nightmare of shock and horror. Now after break, we're going to cross live to get the latest from Creasla. We'll see you after these. Thanks for staying with us. Now, on Friday afternoon, the residents of a small village of Creasla in Donegal had their lives changed forever when an explosion at a local service station resulted in 10 people losing their lives. We are now joined by Virgin Media News reporter Ashley Neat Kushtala, live from Creasla. Good morning, uh, Ashley, thanks for joining us this morning. Listen, I think it struck everybody yeah. all weekend, but particularly yesterday when the names were released and the pictures of the 10 victims involved. What can you tell us about those 10 poor victims? Yes, morning, Tommy. Morning, Alan. It's been a really, really difficult couple of days here for the community in Creasla. And I suppose the enormity of what happened on Friday really hit home yesterday afternoon when Gardaí released the names of the 10 victims and the photographs to go with those names, the faces behind the people who lost their lives here on Friday afternoon. 10 victims in that explosion. The youngest victim was a little girl called Shauna Garway. She lost her life and her father, Robert, 
also died in that blast. One of her neighbours telling us here yesterday that Shauna had just started school in the primary school here and she used to scoot to school every morning with her father. On Friday afternoon they made the decision to go to the local shop to buy a birthday cake for Shauna's mum. One of the other victims was Catherine O'Donnell and her 13-year-old son James Monaghan also died in the blast. These were just ordinary members of the community here in Creasa, people going about their daily business on a Friday afternoon. One teenage girl who lost her life, she had gone in to buy an ice cream, so nothing out of the ordinary when that explosion happened. Um, ten victims, ten families, but a huge community affected by what happened. It's a very small community here, only about 400 people living in the area, so everybody knew one of the victims. Now, the post-mortems will be carried out on those victims in Letterkenny Hospital over the coming days before their remains are returned to their families for that really difficult process process of starting to plan funerals. We know that there is still a number of people being treated in Letterkenny Hospital for the injuries they received here on Friday. And there's also one man in his 20s. He's said to be in a critical condition in St. James's Hospital in Dublin. And as you said, Ashling, a small community, everybody would know the victims. And I'm sure the community has rallied around those affected. Yeah, Chrysler is, is a very small village. Um, anybody we spoke to here yesterday, everybody knew somebody who was connected. They might be neighbours, they might be family members, friends, cousins, but everybody knew somebody. And when this explosion happened here on Friday, an eyewitness we spoke to yesterday, Brian Dolan, said that dozens of community people, dozens of people from right across the area here rushed to the scene. They came in, they tried to move rubble, they tried to do what they could in order to save people who were trapped in the building. Now, obviously, um, the days and weeks ahead are going to be very difficult for the community here, but they have been assured by Antishak Michal Martin when he visited here on Saturday evening that every support and service that they will need will be made available to them. Three of the victims were students, one in the primary school here and two in the college in Milford. And the days um, proper services would be put in place for those students friends and the teachers in those schools in the wider schools community when those students return to school today but nobody really in this community here has been left unaffected. Ashley, in terms of the explosion itself where is the investigation with that with what exactly happened? Yes, well, the, the search and rescue operation was stood down on Saturday evening and that only happened when Gardaí were sure that there was no further fatalities and there was nobody that had been left unaccounted for. So once that section of the operation concluded, then the Garda investigation commenced. Now, the Garda are treating this as a tragic accident, but an investigation naturally will have to take place. Um, the Garda Technical Bureau have been on the scene here for the last day or two. They will remain on the scene seen here for the coming days too and the aim of that investigation is to see if Gardaí can ex establish the cause of the explosion which occurred on Friday. Now the Gardaí Commissioner Drew Harris, he attended the scene here yesterday. He met with many of the emergency services that have worked here tirelessly since Friday afternoon. He also met with man many of the members of Angora the Shia Kona who have also been here um, particularly I suppose stopping and talking to the Gardaí who have been appointed to the victim families as Garda liaison officers. So there's still a very strong presence of the Garda here at the scene and their investigation now will take place over the coming days to see if they can establish the cause of the explosion. Thank you, Ashling. And uh, with you there, Ian Creech, this morning is Father John Joe Duffy, uh, the local priest. And uh, Father, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I mean, a sense of shock there in the community. And obviously, as the local priest, you knew these victims. Yes, it's a, 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 there's just, uh, as I described it, a, a tsunami of grief that ha he, there's a tsunami of grief here in our community. Uh, yes, I, I knew most of the people uh, who were involved in this and our, our hearts go out this morning to the, to the families and also uh, I'm asking the people right across the country and we're getting those prayers from across the country and right throughout the world uh, for those families and in a particular way also for those who remain ill in the hospital as a result of, of this uh, horrific accident uh, that happened here 
that was visited upon us or happened uh, in, in Chrysler. And uh, I, I, we're strengthened by that support uh, that we're getting. Uh, it's like a tidal wave of support coming uh, from right across the entire island and beyond. Uh, in Australia and from Irish people and people here from Chrysler living in other parts of the world. And that means so very much to us at this time. Uh, Pope Francis has sent uh, a message to the people assuring them of his prayers and uh, the British Prime Minister, among others, uh, has also uh, sent her, her support to us. And I ask you to continue that support, uh, to pray if you pray, to light a candle if you cannot pray, or to keep us very much in your hearts, uh, uh, whatever it may be, uh, we are grateful for, th for that support. Absolutely, Father. I think that this is rocked, not just Donegal, the country, the world. And yes, I grew up in a small community, a, a little village where everybody knew everybody. And you can see that in Creaselaw as well. You have been there as the bodies were removed from the rubble, along with the community, or along with family members. How difficult has this whole situation been for you and for everybody in the small village? Father Pat McGarvey, who is a native of the parish, was here with me, as, as were others. Uh, it, it's just heartbreaking. Uh, there are no words to describe it. Words might find us. It's, it's devastating. It's, uh, for, for everyone it is as if it's members of your family that have died. We're, it's like a family community. Uh, the people know each other, people are related to e each other. And just last night, uh, as one of those who died in the terrible tragedy was brought home uh, from Letterkenny, the people stood out along the road for miles and had candles lit along the road and uh, just showing their support, people wanting to do what they can do. And can I just make a, a just mention something this morning to you? Uh, the first responders, the locals who responded first, the emergency services, the Gardaí, the rescue services from both north and south, uh, and those who uh, went in there and searched for uh, the people and then the recovery operation. I have been speaking to the families of the bereaved and the families of the bereaved want to send a very clear message to you this morning, to the people who operated the machinery, to contractors and, uh, and so on, and people from this village and other villages. They are very grateful to you for what you have done. You may be suffering this morning uh, the terrible pain of shock, as I could see it on your faces, as I saw growing, hardened men and women uh, standing around and crying, as I saw that empathy you expressed to the families. They, they are grateful to you this morning, and I know that you uh, who responded are also suffering, and I encourage you uh, to reach out, to reach out to your local doctors and to others, and to the services the HSE are providing and please uh, continue talking to people because it has also had a massive impact on all the people who were there on the scene of the tragedy so please reach out and please uh, seek any help that you need because th this is beyond anything uh, we can comprehend or imagine and uh, uh, the reality of it is only starting to strike us uh, now the reality because we were numbed we were shocked and the reality of the situation is beginning to unfold as we see uh, those who died in this terrible tragedy uh, coming home now from the morgue at Letterkenny Hospital to their family homes and so on. Uh, we're beginning to realise uh, that the terrible tragedy that is here in, in, in Creasla. And Father John Joe, I mean, you're saying that to reach out to people and I know last night there was a vigil, so people are coming together and that will give people there a sense of comfort also. Yeah, people are supporting each other. Um, people are calling to the homes. Uh, as you said, you're from a small rural area and you understand that. Family members, the extended family, the community, everyone is trying to support everyone in the way that is best, in the way that they can. And so also are the services reaching out and the, the empathy from the Gardaí who are going around the houses, uh, speaking with the families and, and so on, and helping the families. And uh, that is so evident, that has been evident throughout. And the, 
just the, the support, people just wanting to support in whatever way that they can and the best support that we can give at this time is our mere presence uh, with those and just give that hug or hand, uh, you know, just be with them, be those ears, I don't know, just uh, to listen to people and that's what we're doing, that's what we're doing as a community. Uh, Father, we can only just say thank you so much, and I think uh, the can people. I just, in can I just say something very? Can I say course, something very quick to you? We are now entering into a period of personal grief and private mourning, and the media have been so respectful throughout. And I thank you for that. And I want to just say it here this morning. And I just ask you. I ask the media, not just you, but the media generally, uh, to give the family as much space uh, as uh, as possible, because they need that space. They need that that time of personal and, 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 and that time of privacy. And I thank you for what you have done, and I, I, I appreciate what you Absolutely. have done. Thank you, Father. Thank, it's going to be very you. difficult uh, yeah. you know, weeks and months ahead. And Father John Joe, John Joe Duffy, thank you so much for talking to us this morning. Thank you. God bless. Now we're going. We're returning to Creaselow now to speak with local pharmacist Fergus Brennan. Fergus, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a tragic two days. Tell us, um, you were in your pharmacy when you heard a loud bang and what else happened after that? Um, I suppose it was, it was the start of a nightmare um, for this community, uh, that a nightmare that we can't wake up from, um, especially those eight households, those eight homes this morning that are dealing with the loss of ten loved ones, totally unexpected. Um, and yeah, it, it was an extraordinary experience to see how quickly people rallied, um, how quickly this community came together. And I know Father John Joe has spoken beautifully about, about uh, an experience that, that so few communities will have um, to see what's possible in the worst of times. Um, and in the pharmacy, uh, um, we were in contact with the, the obviously the local GP v very soon after it happened. I was, I was up here bringing up some uh, emergency, emergency medication and Dr. Stewart and Julie uh, and their team were, were involved from the outset. And as, as Father John Joe said, it, it really, it, it was like being w witnessing uh, a nightmare movie and yet knowing it was happening here in the heart of the community and that absolutely there were going to be people we knew uh, caught up in it. I mean, all of us uh, would have visited this uh, Laverty shop every day. I myself was in there, uh, as so many people will tell you that story, I was in there at exactly the same time, going to the post office and buying a sandwich at, uh, on Wednesday afternoon. Um, so there's such a strong sense here of there for the grace of God go I for the 10 souls that have been lost. Um, we look at the pictures released yesterday. Uh, we all genuinely feel um, that it, it could have been any, any one of us because this shop was the heart of the community. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just, it's the most, such a sad story, Fergus. And, and you mentioned how that's the heart of the community. The pharmacy is also a real, such a, a, a key area in a local community and a local village. And of course, that's where you work. And you, you knew so many of the 10 victims. And in particular, Martin, whose daughter was Shauna, just yes. five years of age. They used to come into the pharmacy. What can you tell us yes, about I mean, we, Martin we and knew, particularly Shauna? Yeah, we, we knew, well, I, I want to pay tribute to all, all the victims, uh, obviously sometimes in the pharmacy. M Martin was a carer for his mom, a dedicated carer, a really loving son. And so he visited us, us often. And he was a very special guy. He, he was a, a Celtic fan. He was, he, you know, he was well known about the town. And, and as it turns out, that first call that we got on Friday afternoon was from Martin's mom, you know, frantically looking for him. And I suppose that's how, uh, that's how the story became so human for us in the pharmacy. And Shauna, um, yeah, Shauna was just just a very memorable little girl. You see her picture 
um, and it's just heartrending. Uh, this story is heartrending. We have two teenagers and a young child lost in a small community uh, at a time that's so difficult uh, in the world, so difficult for young people. So uh, there will be so much trauma for young people to deal with. Um, but we knew we we knew the other we knew many of the other victims as well as customers and patients in the pharmacy. Um, uh, we remember Tina, Martina. We, we knew her as Tina, who who tragically lost her life at her work, um, and she served all of us when we went up for sandwiches and milk for our tea break. So, I suppose as a pharmacist in the pharmacy, we are a witness to to the, the mental trauma that's unfolding, the physical trauma. Um, you know, we, we've already had survivors, we've people who managed to escape from the, maybe from the apartments upstairs, some people who, who made it out of, out of the shop, um, the extraordinary local responders. Um, we, we're starting to see, I suppose, the human story unfold in the pharmacy. Uh, people coming in um, for medication and that stunned disbelief that this has happened is evident. Um, there's, there's a quietness in people. They don't know what to say to each other just yet. Um, and I've witnessed some very emotional hugs uh, between survivors and helpers and family members uh, as this community comes to terms with this extraordinary, extraordinary nightmare experience. I mean, it's just, it is horrific. And listen, Fergus, I know that you are doing everything that you can, like the whole community up there, and we can't thank you enough and the people who've been affected as well. Thank you so much, uh, pharmacist Fergus Brennan. Thank you so much for talking to us this thank morning. Thank you, Fergus. Thank you. Now join us to discuss those stories and, of course, more is Bauer Media. Political correspondent Sean Defoe, good morning to you, Sean. Good morning, guys. A really Sean. difficult weekend for everybody there. But this story in the Independent this morning about Shauna and her father Fergus, uh, uh, Robert Garwe. Um, Shauna was a five-year-old girl. She was going to buy her mum a birthday cake. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? Where do you even start with something like that? And like Fergus was saying there, it's the, the randomness of it all. That like I'm sure there's people who were there this morning going, well, I was in there 20 minutes before Could getting be. petrol. I yeah. was on the way to get petrol there on my way home. And that what story about that's just an utter gut punch. You know, they put off the birthday celebrations to the weekend, as lots of us do. We were all busy during the week yeah. and they went in to get some treats and to get a cake and they never came out at the end of it. And I suppose two things kind of struck me when I was looking at particularly the photos over the weekend. I think that's when it became real and you see all the faces, you see how young they all were. You know, yeah. the oldest was, was Hughes, the farmer who was 59 years old, who could live for another 20, 30 years. And then the youngest, as you say, Shauna, only five years old. And then just, just that randomness that there for the love of God could have gone I and could have gone any one of them who you was there. You could resonate with any of them, you know, someone's daughter, cousin, sister, mm. that's mm. like what makes it so relatable and heartbreaking for the entire country, yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I think when you get like a tragedy like this, you sort of look for reasons. Like when anyone dies, you look for yeah. reasons. Why did this happen? And there's just, there isn't at the moment anywhere reason there. Obviously there's going to be an investigation to what actually caused it, but it's such a lovely part of the world as well. I know Creasa holiday in Donegal quite a lot for the last two years, particularly during COVID. And it's yeah. sort of a place that's on the way to a lot of other places and it's a lovely community, the people up there. Like Donegal is obviously a beautiful county, but the most beautiful thing about it is the people who live there in those kind of small communities, you know, so it's just, yeah, it's devastating. And that's what makes it such a special place, of course. Listen, we, we have to move on. There are, of course, some other news stories as well and a big story that, that really, we, we talked about last Thursday as well, and it's continued over the weekend, is about this Irish dance scandal. And of course, it's interesting to see. So the, the, the body behind this fetch fixing, they're still in funds of more than two million. And some of the judges are being paid a serious amount of money What's that, a thousand, a thousand euro, euro a day. day up to? Yeah, this is really interesting. So this is figures that the Irish Independent and Ellen Coyne have got uh, on the accounts, basically, of Commissioner uh, Narinka Gaelica. And uh, it's saying that they have more than two million euro in their accounts after all of their different expenses have been paid. It's been built up over a number of years through surpluses that they've had. Some of them relatively modest. It was about 41,000 euro in 2021. But this sort of built and built, which kind of runs contrary to that ethos that's been yeah. there for a long time in Irish mm -hmm. town. You sort of think a lot of it's voluntary and people are there sort of for the, the good of their health. <laughs> yeah. And now you wonder, 
wonder, are they actually there for the good of their health? And that, yeah, some judges can get up to €1,000 a day plus their expenses for actually judging. Expensive enough to become a judge in the first place, the test itself costs €800, and if you need to repeat it, you might need to pay And it's supposed fee to be well. quite difficult, apparently. Like, you, no mm. one really knows how to study for it. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's a, sort of one of these opaque tests that they don't yeah. exactly... It's not like the Leaving Search, you know, where you're sitting, yeah. here's your follow your guide. It's, uh, so a little bit opaque, so they're kind of giving out a bit about that. But it's just interesting that when there is so much of a focus on everything being voluntary and being about the good of the community and the good of Irish dancing, because part of their remit is to further and protect the heritage of Irish dancing. Actually, there's a lot of money sloshing around there. I, I was just... Because Leo Varadkarest spoke about him talking about this last week and said, that, like, Irish dancing has a worldwide appeal. Mm. And for something like this, and even Catherine Martin talked about the need to address this matter quickly and transparently. Like, where is this going to go? What are they going to do here? It's a really good question because part of the difficulty is they don't get any state funding, which makes it a lot harder to investigate um, bodies like this. And you saw this a couple of years ago with, with institutions like the FAI, which aren't fully state funded, but are only part state funded. There's only so much that the state can push or can demand for an investigation. Oh, yeah, right. So yeah. obviously there is one going on now from the uh, CLRG. They're looking into it, but they're sort of looking into themselves or yeah. the stuff that's going on. You always question, how is that a very, very independent investigation? So the politicians, of course, are going to say, oh, yeah, it needs to be looked into 100%, yeah. but so somehow maybe yeah. in, in, the, in the grand scheme of what's on their plate, will, uh, will Irish dancing yeah. fall down the pecking order? And do you think the Irish dancing world will recover from this scandal? Well, it, it's interesting that what has sort of... It's sort of opened a door, like a lot of these things do, where now you're reading a commentary from foreign Irish dancers and from parents saying, well, this isn't the only thing going on. Actually, teachers are, you know, that were shouting at my children and there were people kicked wow. out of different different schools after you complained about it. So I think there's a, a little bit of a rug being pulled here and maybe there is more to come, more to be discussed, which will obviously affect the reputation here. But as yeah. you said, Tommy, like, it's huge. It's almost bigger outside of Ireland, mm -hmm. in, in the States in particular, than it is here. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, we got a great response to that last week when we were talking about the Irish dancers because it is such a, a huge part of Irish culture mm. and, and this is not just in this country but around the world as well. We'd love to know what you make of this, the fetch fixing, but really we'd love to hear, you know, we're going to spend a big part of the show today reading out messages about the tragedy that happened in Donegal up in Creasla and listen, send in your messages. Did you know any of the victims? Do you know any of the family? And even about the emergency services, yeah. jo John Joe Duffy, the father John Joe Duff Duffy talked about they worked tirelessly through the night, the whole community, and it was a huge part of it. And so do get in touch with us, 0896 111 Sean Defoe from Bauer Media, thank you so much for, for joining us. us. Now, we have plenty more Ireland M coming up after this short break. You're very welcome back. We have a lot of texts coming in, of course, about the tragedy that happened recently. Yeah. It, just, like, it just really hits your heart whenever you yeah. open any newspapers this morning. You see their faces and just some of the, the messages written about the, the, the different people. You know, mm. like even just Leona Harper there is believed that she just went in to buy an ice cream with her friend. Well, that's what we were saying. And it really brought it to, to reality yesterday when you saw the pictures. Yeah. You know, and the pictures yeah. came on our screens yesterday and we were just looking at it and you were going, my God. And and was just saying there, for the grace of God, go I, because like some people would have been on their way to that petrol station, yeah. may have been there 10 minutes beforehand and just left. Mm -hmm. And you just go, my God, how, how lucky am I? And thank you, you're, uh, we're getting lots of texts coming in this morning. Helen said, such an unbelievable tragedy. I just can't imagine what the families are going through. What's so scary is that those people were just going about their normal daily life. It goes to show how quickly your whole life can change, and it really does. You really for, just for, never for that know. community will never yeah. be the same again in Creasley. Oh. Never be the same again. Pat, there's just been so many devastating tragedies recently, especially involving young children. It's just hard to try and make sense of it all. And that's what Father John Joe Duffy said. Yeah. You yeah. know, why why this village? Mm. Why these times? Who, you know, the like, it's, just, it's, it's horrendous and really and I, th I think the good thing about a small community like that is that they will rally together and because yeah. they knew people, they will rally together and I'm sure the, the yeah. sense of, of just being there for everybody will be, will be great. And Father John Joe, I mean, uh, over the next couple of weeks, the funerals now will be the next thing, mm -hmm. and like, oh, and to be at the, he'll be at the centre of that, giving comfort to everybody. And it's a big yeah. thing that he asked, and he made a big point of this, and asking the media, the media for privacy. To, yeah, yeah. Now, listen, the media have been there all weekend, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's really important that now they step back and give people time to grieve. Yeah, yeah. and not like reporters maybe or from 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 meat from TV and radio and newspapers trying to maybe 
get a, an insight into the family's mm -hmm. grieving or trying to get a comment from yeah. people in the families and I suppose that is has to be respected. Yeah. Um, text, we have a text from Olivia here actually. The, the community seems to be doing everything they can for those involved. It really is a case of when something so awful like this happens, people really unite to help one another. It's so powerful and uplifting to see. That's what like the community, that's what stands out to me. Like I think um, it was uh, one of the victim's brothers saying the amount of accommodation that has been offered to everyone, all the victim's families, food, water, just yeah. everything. Just people doing anything that they can really to play a part in helping yeah. everyone with their grievance. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Uh, we just got a text in here from Yvonne and Mead and said, such an awful tragedy in Chrysler. I've just heard on the radio you can make a donation in any post office around the country, which I'll definitely be doing this morning because this is unbelievably sad. So mm, okay. um, any... on post, obviously, then, and because the post office was part of that community where yeah. the explosion was. Yeah, and that's uh, Listen, keep those text messages coming in. Please do, we would love to hear from you and we'll, we'll try to get through as many of them as we can right through the show. And of course, um, just send a text 0896 111111. We'll be back for more Ireland AM after these. Time now to take a look at this morning's papers. They're all dominated by the tragic explosion in Donegal. We'll start with the Irish Times. It's headline, Creasla grieves for seven adults and three children killed by blast. Ten red candles will continue to burn on the altar of St. Michael's Church in Creasla through the week. One for each victim of the huge explosion that partly destroyed a local shop, petrol station and surrounding buildings on Friday. The lives lost, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, neighbours and friends. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The Examiner leads with that same story, their headline, A Nightmare of Shock and Horror. We hold you in our hearts is the top story on the Daily Mail. Mayor goes with pray for them. The star leads with smiles we'll never forget. And finally, the Herald goes with A Nightmare of Shock and Horror. Now, we have had a lot of texts coming in about this, but I think we should just quickly mention as well that uh, if people would like to donate, um, you can go to your local post office yes. and make a donation to post offices across the country. And also, Brian sent us in a message here to say a GoFundMe page has also been set by Jared McFadden, a Creasla native living in Brisbane, to help those affected. Um, and I think that it will come up on screen, screen on as screen. well. And I think um, there's a quarter of a million already been raised on it. So it's just, really? yeah, amazing. amazing. But Marie got onto us and I think this, um, we have to read this out because we spoke to uh, Father John Joe, the local priest there this morning from Chrysler. And Marie says, how difficult has the tragedy been for Father John Joe Duffy? He's been an inspiration in his strength, the community over the past few days. Let us not forget that he is human too and that the toll of this must be taken on him and all the clergy. Please send our noted gratitude to him. Well, we're delighted that we can he, do that for you. He really um, was amazing, today. Cassie, wasn't he? He was mm. so off, just the way he spoke so gracefully and he just must be a pillar for the community yeah. at this time. You know, yeah. everyone kind of looks to God in these mm. moments of absolute tragedy. So I can, I can only imagine what he's feeling. And even for him, like he kind of said, you know, to think of the other people, but yeah. actually he mm. is somebody who's really the figurehead yeah. in a lot of this. So selfless, yeah. yeah. To the people at Jer and Tyrrell's Passes, to the people of Creasler, our hearts and sympathy go out to all the community and especially the families of all those deceased. And of course, we send our condolences also here this morning. And there's lots more coming in as well. There. Yeah, we have one from Kieran. Having lost my wife last year and going through the grieving process, it's time for the media to back away and let the families grieve in private. We will be donating at the post office today. Yeah, that's yeah. what Father John Joe Duffy yeah. said. That mm, yeah. listen, the media have been amazing and been there to to highlight it, but I think the time is right to step away. Do please keep those text messages in. We, of course, have that uh, that uh, Just Giving link on our Facebook page and social media as well. And, of course, you can go to the post office too. Um, do keep those texts coming in. 0896 111 Now, after the break, Devin Toner, Irish rugby player, former anyway, he's, turned, he's swapped the shorts for the suit since retiring from rugby. That's coming up after the break. Welcome back. We have our next guest. Has four, he has four Championship Cup wins, seven Pro 14 titles, and a Grand Slam to his name. 
He's just showing off now, isn't he? <laughs> yes, before we chat to Ireland's second row, Devin Toner, let's take a look at some of his career. High, very high lights. <laughs> Ah, oh, you and Johnny Sex and besties, besties. <laughs> How are you getting on, Dave? Great to have you with us. How's life after the green jersey? Yeah, it's uh, it's doing good. Not too bad. Retired there in June. Yeah, so um, starting the new chapter of my life now. So it's all going so 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 far so good. Anyway, I mean, it was an incredible career. Um, I mean, yeah, we talked about all the trophies and medals that you won. Mm. How have you, like, in terms of preparing, listen, this is the thing we talked about, and I am obsessed with talking about it as well, yeah. having been through it. Mm. Like, in terms of preparation to leave the, the Leinster jersey behind and the Irish jersey behind, mm. it's hard to recreate that again. So how mm. did you prepare for the next chapter? Um, I think it's all individual, first of all. Um, but I think when, if I look back on my preparation, I think I didn't start early enough. I think when you see the young lads coming into the academy now, I think every single one of them is doing degrees, every single one of them is doing ex uh, extra study. But I think I only started really looking at it when I was about maybe 33 or so. Really, yeah. I started kind of talking to a career coach and, and, and um, it kind of getting your head around then because it's it's something you don't really want to think about when you're playing about yeah. about, about what's going to go happen afterwards because yeah. you're so uh, you're so focused on what's happening at the weekend who you're mm -hmm. playing the next weekend next weekend so it's uh, it's something that you need to start preparing for a lot earlier but as, as I say rugby players Ireland do do a huge amount for the young lads now and and for everyone now so yeah. I kind of started thinking about it when I was around maybe 33 or so. And you are coming to grips now with the financial world, which is your new job. That's kind of where I got my beginning after college. So how, tell us, like, how was the difference yeah. between a nine to five and playing professional rugby? No, it's a, it's a bit different. Yeah, yeah, no, as you say, it's, I started a new job there uh, four weeks ago. I'm, I'm getting into the financial planning world. Wow. I've kind of got a relationship role in, in, in a company called uh, Pax Finance or Ask Paul on Instagram. I'm sure Paul is in version the, the whole time yeah, talking she's with Paul Mary here, of course. He's always here, but... Yeah. Um, I think I got an opportunity with, with them because I actually I went in for a financial consultation myself. I wanted a bit of a plan for the future, and and it's kind of a relationship grew with Paul over over a year or so, and and he um, he kind of saw saw an opportunity uh, there for me to, to uh, as a kind of a relationship building with clients and stuff. So I kind of it was a world that that really appealed to me as well. Yeah. Um, in the middle, or I've got one QFA to do, of one exam to do in, in January. How so. many That's exams amazing. did you have to do? Then? There's, there's six exams yeah. to do QFAs, okay. yeah, and I've done five, so I've got one. And you one passed them all in one passed, go? Yeah, exactly. I passed five. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hey, what? Yeah. His so brain's in there somewhere. I know. <laughs> yeah, Wouldn't yeah. have known it while he was playing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd say now, like finishing work at five, having the weekends back, yeah. your family must be so delighted. Was it important to you just to have that family time now? Absolutely. Yeah. Like obviously, I've got two young kids. I've got a five-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, and I think I just love being able to plan for the weekends, being yeah. able to say, oh yeah, I can do that at the weekend. Yeah. Like I, we, we've had, um, we've had Centre Parks book for the last year oh, yeah. <laughs> because I know, yeah, I can do that weekend. You know, so it's it's, it's great being able to plan stuff in advance oh, and plan look, holidays. There they are. And, and uh, just have your weekends back to yourself, yeah. Uh, well, Centre Parks, I'd be interested to see what it's like, because one of the things I always know must have been a bugbear for you is whenever you're travelling every weekend into the hotel rooms, you never yeah. know what the size of the beds are going to be. And oh, Dave, like, what are you, six foot, six foot six 11? Foot six foot 10. Six foot 10. Six oh. foot 10. Yeah. So, I mean, and particularly, I think, wasn't it yeah. Japan? It was the worst, yeah. actually, the Rugby World Cup in Japan. <laughs> no, it wasn't the Rugby World Cup. We, 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 we toured Japan before the World Cup. And oh, so they knew this time for the World Cup to have the no, beds No, I didn't go to the World Cup, remember? <laughs> oh, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, should have known that, shouldn't I? Yeah. We, toured, we toured Japan before the World Cup, and they, and, and they obviously heard that I was coming, and they put a little extender on the end of the bed. 
and it was the most superfluous thing ever because I, I, like, I'm just, I grew up with, with my legs hanging out at the end of the bed, so like, I kind of prefer it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So I literally just took it away. So <laughs> you removed it after yeah, the yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> What was it like when? Because we used to always go into rooms, and there's always sometimes to be a double and a single. Yeah. Mm. Did you just always just absolutely automatically? Yeah. I got the double. That's sorted. No absolutely. matter who you were with. It yeah, was a uh, given. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And yeah. tell me, and what about the rugby wise? Like. Did you just feel the time was right yeah. to step away? You thought, like, yep. when did that moment come that you knew this was going to be my last season? Um, I kind of knew the last season was going to be the last season because, uh, first of all, I only got that contract for the last season kind of by the skin of my okay. teeth, really. Like, So okay. I kind of knew that I wasn't going to be getting another one. Uh, like, there was a couple of opportunities. I could have probably went to France or I was even looking at Japan for a bit, like, but... Um, I, I was kind of weighing up my options. I kind of had the young family. I was like, I didn't want to uproot them for one year because Max was starting school. He's in junior infants now, so he's starting school in September. So I was kind of weighing all, up on all my options. And then uh, I obviously did the financial plan and I got talking to Paul and, and there was an opportunity to, to, to get a job as well. So I think just weighing everything up, it, it, the time was right, you know? Yeah. I was 36 as well. Like, do you mean I got, I, got, I got the best out of it. You got a hell of a run out of it. Uh, How's the body? Because, yeah. and even... Like, you didn't have many injuries. You were very fortunate oh. through your career. And listen, it's very much in the news at the minute, and particularly there was a Scottish report about the long-term yeah. impacts mm. of rugby and mm. certainly on the likes of dementia and stuff. Was that oh. something that ever concerned you when you were actually playing? Like, it's, it's concerning when you hear it now, when you hear all the headlines, um, obviously. But uh, I, as you say, I was lucky with injury. I, I never really got a serious head knock. Mm. I never got a serious injury, which was unbelievable. So it's really hard for me to comment on this sort of, sort of yeah. things because I've never really had a, bad, had a bad one. So I was never really concerned. Um, but again, when you see all the headlines, it is pretty concerning. But the situation. protocols nowadays yeah. are so much more no, it's strict and, and, and mm. set out compa compared to probably when we started yeah, off. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you can see it is very hard for the RFU and World Rugby as well because obviously they're doing their utmost to, to, to bring the protocols in place and, and, and bring the tackle height down and everything. So like, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough situation. Like. Um, and talk to mm. us then about away from it. You were on the restaurant. The restaurant, yeah. yeah. So you must have been cooking up a storm at home to prepare for that. Uh, Tell us about <laughs> that. Um, I didn't do much practice now, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> <Whatever>. <laughs> uh, no, it was a great experience. I loved it. Uh, it was literally just one day. We were in at nine in the morning. Leave at eleven at night, and 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 it was a great experience. It was a great crack. Uh, all the oh, chefs were brilliant, um, and it was just a great experience to do. Yeah. We have a cool clip, actually, of you getting your five stars, doing better five than stars. any other Irish rugby player. We have to, we have to take a look at this, Tommy. <laughs> I think five stars would mean the world to Devon. I think he's very competitive. He is in life, he is in sport, he is in work. And seeing Tommy Bow doing this a couple of years ago, he would love to be Tommy Bow. That should be doable. Five. <laughs> Five stars. <laughs> oh my God. How, how do you feel about that? I'm devastated. <laughs> I actually thought they deleted that episode of me getting two stars. I was oh so God. I was I was so I was so annoyed with that. Um, but you enjoyed it as an experience, so and the competitive oh. juices obviously came out there. Fair play. Absolutely, yeah, no, loved it. That's uh, your brother as well, isn't it? That was with Darryl, Mary, yeah, your yeah. wife as he well. He knew how much that meant to you. Yeah, he, he was trying to act sober as well. I think he had a few too many peronis. <laughs> Did you enjoy the heat? to the kitchen because I actually thought that that's where you were going to go because you can people who follow you online food is a big part of your life yeah love it uh, but I think I'm, I, I love home cooking I'm okay. like professionally I'm like as I said I want my, I want my, my, my weekends back yeah and I yeah. think if you're if, you, if you're if you're doing anything with food and restaurants or something you're on when everyone else is off yeah so there'll be Friday night Saturday Sunday you know what I mean so like I think I just needed to. I needed to get a proper timetable and plates for myself, to be honest. And has so, it prompted yeah. you to help out more at home now with the dinners? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I, Mary, my wife, will say as well. Like w the two of us, you literally cook what the kids will eat. Oh, of not yeah, what we of want. Do you know what yeah, I mean? So it's yeah. literally like bolognese and curries and stuff every <laughs> night. Like, oh, we're know. full on meltdown in our house last night. <laughs> I know. Eat it. I know oh. yeah. uh, <laughs> listen, you're also getting involved in a special cause, a new campaign to benefit uh, a lot of families in need this Christmas. Yeah. yeah so. Team Hope uh, are doing a 
Christmas shoebox appeal this year. They're, we're, we're trying to get 200,000 uh, shoebox filled for, for little kids in Africa and Eastern Europe. Wow. Um, so it's literally, you can go and fill your own shoebox with, they say, the four W's. So something to wear, something to write, something to wash, and a wow. Okay. So wash, so like toothbrushes, shower gels, something yeah. to wear, something to write with, some colouring pencils, something just to make a, um, a little kids Christmas. Super thoughtful. You know? It's so a brilliant. Thoughtful. And something yeah. so easy. Like yeah. I think Absolutely. about my house, yeah. the amount of excess stuff you have there. Absolutely. And it's so yeah. simple. Just stick it in a, yeah. a shoebox. Of course, it is Team Hope. Uh, the Christmas shoebox appeal. Yeah. Uh, shoebox week, week, which runs from the 31st of October to the 6th of November. And just for those at home, so we can donate these at deals, is it? You can it? go to any deals, okay. uh, first stop and Toy Master. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So here, this is the suit gear. This is you heading straight into the office now, Absolutely. is it? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm back into Slurgan now after this, yeah. <laughs> well, listen, Dan, it's great to catch up with you again. No great Thank you so much. Thanks so Cheers, much for thank that. You. Uh, now, remember, you can catch the restaurant at 9 o'clock on Tuesdays on Virgin Media 1. Still to come, the happy pair of lads are cooking up a storm in the kitchen. What's not to look forward to more than that? <laughs> See you after the break. Breakfast is being served now and homemade granola is on the menu. And who better to make it? Steve and Dave from the Happy Pear. Thank you so much for joining us. Great Thanks to have you with us. Oh, great to, to, be here. to be here. Okay, so, so we make loads of granola. We literally make tons of granola every week. So we're going to show you how to make granola in five minutes. No is... way. Yeah. Five minutes. So this so is just high protein. protein. Okay, this great. Is... <laughs> Wait, look at my task. It's quite okay, okay, sorry, Tommy. Carry no, on. you guys carry on there. <laughs> okay, where you... How do you start then, first of Okay, all? first step, rather than bake, this in oat flakes and kneading an oven. You're going to do this in one pan. Because so the granola usually takes about 30 minutes to bake in the yeah. oven. Or even yeah. longer, you know, and you bake it. Whereas we're going to make it... Ours is high protein and gluten free, so tick, tick. And how do you not make, how does it not take okay. 30 minutes? Here we then? go, you're ready. Wakey, you see, you're ready okay. for it. Okay, so you go to your press, you go, oh wow, okay, what, what will we put in a granola? And you go, jeez, I found some nuts. Okay, what about oh, almonds? Does it matter what type of nuts, Dave? No, literally just pop in a handful of walnuts. Okay. Handful okay. of nuts. I've got two handfuls of nuts. Okay, okay. Right. Type of nuts. Okay. there you go. So, yeah, Throw I've got the nuts seeds. In. I think I have that at home, yeah. Great. Yeah. Pumpkin seeds, really high in protein, so I'm going to go with a good handful yeah, like, of pumpkin what seeds. Nuts are ideally best. They've kind Walnut of got is the best. Walnut is the best in terms of. Yeah. For omega three to omega six ratio, and we're okay. literally going to blitz this for about thirty seconds. And Dave, if I didn't have a food processor, could I do this? You just chop it. Okay, yeah, so just use a knife. Okay, so we're good. Okay. It's taking a little longer. Now okay. Hang on, uh, boom, we're done. Okay, so we're just pulsing. We're not. Oh, going to pulse a little longer. So okay. So you want a bit of like? While we're at it. Okay, so okay. we've got our pan nice and hot. Okay. We're going to cook this in a wide bottom non-stick pan. So okay. ideally, you don't need any oil. So we're going to pop, so in essence, we're going to caramelise our nuts and seeds to start with. OK, so because they're obviously fairly finely ground. Yeah, but you want them to be a little bit coarse so it looks like a granola, if you know what it I mean. It does, yeah. So it's to mimic that. So the main determinant of when it's ready is we're going to put some desiccated coconut. So this caramelises quite quickly, and as it caramelises, it smells like brown sugar. Do you have any oil or anything? No, nope, nothing in the pan. Yes. So we're just no, because you'll brown it better. You'll get more caramelization to start with. Just straight the off oil. the hot yeah. pan. And then we'll pop the oil to add a bit of fat to it. Okay. Oh, at the end. Calories. Okay. Yeah, oil and sweetener because uh, that'll give the, the the kind of granola taste. Granola's sweeter. You know, it's got fat and it's got sweetener. And that. tell me, you have a new app out at the moment as well. Are these mm. the sort of things that are on it? Yeah, literally the app's launching today. It's World oh, Mental it? Health Day. Yeah, today is day one. Don't believe it. Uh, it's called the Happy Pair Healthy Living. It's on Android and the Google Play Store. And it's really the whole idea is people know what to do to be healthy, but they don't have the support. Yeah. So it's really about supporting people to form the healthy habits. We've got hundreds of recipes. We've got our courses with gastroenterologists, cardiologists, gynecologists. Like, we have a happy heart course, a happy... What, men... all on the app? Yeah, yeah, happy Like gut. videos. We've got a yeah, yeah, We've got pretty... tons of it. Like, it's really amazing. It really is kind of cutting And there's a, a forum involved. Yeah, there's yeah. a community within it. We do a lot of lives. Like, this morning, uh, or this evening, Raj is doing a wind down and meditation. Tomorrow morning, I'm doing a rise and shine. We're doing a cooking demo tomorrow evening. So there's all sorts of... Uh, it's living. It's okay, okay, can you smell it? There's a little can, bit of caramelisation. Yeah. Burn, actually, You can lads. see, yeah. No, no that's, that's caramelisation. That's <laughs> reaction. That's what I try and tell my wife. No, no, it's caramelising. <laughs> it's it's spaghetti bone is. Okay, so we're going to put, we're gonna put a little bit of fat. So we're putting coconut oil. You could use whatever fat you have, as in some, some, some form of an oil, whether olive oil, sunflower oil. I'm putting in two tablespoons of coconut oil because it adds a nice kind of crispy mouthfeel. And we're going to go with two tablespoons of maple syrup or sweetener of choice. What, um, what's your thought on seed oils? Seed oils. 
Uh, I think oil, well, the thing about oil is oil is twice the amount of calories as is protein and carbs. It's about 4,000 calories per pound. Okay. So it's about using as little as possible because most of us get more than enough calories. Yeah. And oil, like literally a tablespoon of oil has 120 calories. Wow. So it's got a lot of calories in it. So I'd yeah. say it's about using as little as possible in most And coconut cases. oil you think is kind of... Well, this, I think none of them are healthy. It's kind of no, like saying okay. what cigarette is the healthiest. Okay. You know the yeah. way? Okay. In essence, like because it's a refined food, you're taking the fat from nothing but the whole food source. Yeah, so yeah. it's not to say oil is bad, it's just less healthier. Okay. In other yeah. way. So in terms of this, so we've got a basic granola here. You can season it in any way. I'm going to put just a pinch of salt, which might sound strange, but it actually will accentuate the sweet. I like a bit of um, cinnamon. Little pinch of cinnamon. Season it to, the, to your heart's content. Mm. Yeah. And then if you like dried food, put a bit of dried it fruit like through it. Proper, like granola. Like, like you don't need the oats. Like you'll taste it and it's delicious. Yeah. And literally you leave this cool and you put some raisins in it, maybe chop some mango. I'm going to put some fruit. fig because we're just being really And how long can you store this for? Just for the people at home. Store and what can you store it in? Just a, a month, even six So weeks. just a simple little jar like that. Airtight yeah. jar. Airtight. It lasts for... Three Ooh. to six weeks, no bother. Okay, yeah. it's great. Are we going to try, some? try it? Yes. Mom, that's right. Here, yeah. look, you've got your look. Oh. There's your uh, the yogurt your coconut well. yogurt for look at this. Delicious. Here we go. Oh, we've got this now, remember the party right. line is ten out of ten. Do you remember? Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, well, <laughs> or five out of I'm five. With Devin Toner Tonal. there on with the restaurant. So it's a little um, hot, but it's very. You'll taste it. Very hot, but it'll catch you nice. Very sweet and lovely. <laughs> Sweet and lovely, off. great. So we was up for a swim this morning? Uh, no, we'd get up at half six. Well, I was up at half five actually getting little bits. You know, like when you're releasing an app like this and you've done two years, you're kind of nervous. It's like... It's, it's taken us two years to build it all. So it's, really? you know, today it feels like the exam where you're, put, you're finally birthing it out to the world. So a little nervous and apprehensive of it, And why an app? Because like you have books, you have unbelievable social media. Like is there... Money. It's no. Money. <laughs> Alan, no, like what money. You say, it's, a, it's the way to support people. Like people have it in their pocket, and it's yeah. essentially people. As I said, they know what to do. But it's essentially me and Stephen living in your pocket as your health coach, okay. really. And you can reach people more. You can connect with them more. And people have their phones on them everywhere. So yeah. it's a lot better and, than a website. And, and, and also, like if you look to the longest lived population of the planet, the reason why they live long, healthy lives isn't because they won the genetic lottery. It's because the healthy choice is the easy choice. Yeah. So the more we can create an environment that forces us to make the healthy choice, the more healthy And for be. someone just beginning a health journey, can they use this yeah. app? Yeah, is this for them too? Yeah, Absolutely, yeah, it really is. It's like step by step. Wherever people are at, it's, yeah. it's meeting people where they're at and bringing them on Amazing. the journey. So. Brilliant. So we're very right. excited. I'm waiting, looking for a spoon here. Do, what, do you have another spoon? Here. Here there was, there was only one spoon in the just canteen. Just use your fingers. fingers. The organic way. Good <laughs> oh, There you go. Tell me, Bob. What do you think? No, it's actually very tasty. Isn't it? For something that's five minutes and so easy. Yeah, no, it is. So it's just nuts and desiccated. Literally nuts and seeds. And if you're allergic to nuts, just base it on seeds. And so great for kind of after a workout or training or anything because it is high in protein and it does fill you up because mm. protein actually does fill you up. Lads, it's time. delicious. Um, get your app on the new, on all It's on the app your... store and the Google Play store. There's a seven day free trial so download it, give it a shot. It's We're delighted with it and we hope to we get the chance to support lots of people. David C. Flint from the Happy Pair. Thank you as thank always. You so thank you yeah, yeah, I'll get so much. myself yeah. a spoon. Now Al, what else is coming up? That's an image I didn't expect to have today. The Happy Pair in me pocket. <laughs> 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 there, there you go. Uh, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> now, coming up on the catwalk, we're going to help you navigate your That's wardrobe broken. for hybrid working. We'll see you after these. Thanks for staying with us. Now, gone are the days of wearing suits in the office. And here to help us with our hybrid workwear is stylist Sarah Rickard, good morning to good you. Good morning. And I suppose the pandemic has changed everything, the way we wear things into the office, because where most people are doing maybe one day at home, two days at home as well? Absolutely. It is all about that hybrid work life. So people's needs have totally changed. So anything that worked for them pre-pandemic just doesn't work for their new work life. They're now not just working from home. They're obviously on Zoom a lot and then they're going in for face-to-face -face mm -hmm. meetings. So their wardrobes, they have different demands basically from their clothes. You know, so yeah. that's what we're looking at today. OK, let's have a look at our first look. So. Yeah, so Haiza is wearing... This is kind of how to get away with wearing jeans to the office, I suppose. It's still... I'm still focusing on that waist-up dressing. So she's wearing this amazing printed jacket mm. that has, like, it's quite a statement. So I've kept everything quite minimal and sleek underneath. Um, she's wearing beautiful earrings by Holtquist. And then she's wearing just, just a simple black polo neck. And again, 
I'm always about longevity, versatility, and comfort. You know, Get regardless. Loads of wears out yes. of that, yeah. So all of these pieces should be able, you should be able to wear in every different event in your life. Um, obviously, the statement jacket is really key, and then the jeans are just a straight fit jean that are super versatile. And again, you can wear them for. And like this jacket, then obviously you could wear this if, if, for going out as well. Yeah, you can wear it dressier. You could wear it with like a pair of satin trousers with mm. a skirt. You know, it's. Because it is that black and cream, it's it's monochrome. You're going to get away with lots of different ways to wear. And then I, I just have her with um, the leather bag, which I think is super because it, it, it's a great day-to-day -day bag, but you can fit your laptop in it. So, it, but without oh, it being course, yeah. a laptop bag. If you are bag, moving from yeah. office to home and, exactly. and, and working yeah, like yeah. that. You can just um, put it in. And then obviously the boots as well are fabulous. I, I see a lot of my clients wanting to get back to a heel. You know, mm. there was such a long time where people were allergic to putting on heels, but now they're kind of ready to dress up. So even they want to dress up their jeans now as well, which is great. Oh, good. lovely look. Thank you very much. Uh, Noma is up next. Yes. So Noma is in the midi dress. And again, the most, possibly the most versatile mm. piece in everyone's wardrobe. Um, so I have just made it a little bit more office appropriate by layering the cream polo neck underneath and having it open. But still, again, having that most of the detail in the upper half. So if you were going, if you were doing Zoom meetings and or in person or doing a school run And I between, suppose when it's work where the earrings and the jewellery have to be to a minimum, you can't have big, huge bangles absolutely. type yes. things. Yeah, yeah, they have to be the finer, mm. the better, I feel. I've just swapped out the little Thai uh, fabric um, belt that was on it and just added a leather belt just to give it a bit of an added polish, you know, just so she looks like a little bit more groomed. And then the same bag again that works as a laptop bag too, which is super in that great shade. Um, and this, this dress does close up, you don't need to have, you don't need to layer with the Absolutely, but I suppose I'm just thinking autumn, winter, and I'm, th you know, uh, like different ways to it wear. It just gives it a different look, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, yes. absolutely. So I've shown before where I've layered chunky knits over the, the dresses, yeah. so this is just showing how you can actually put a fine knit underneath and it doesn't add bulk and you don't feel like you're two sizes bigger than you are, you know? And then I've just added the suede boots as well. Um, again, you could wear it with trainers and a little biker jacket. I, I'm always thinking of different ways to wear yeah. these pieces. So, but, but this that way dress is so versatile, you get so front. many wears yeah. out of it. Yeah. To have a couple of staples like that, is that the idea? Absolutely. You should always be looking for versatility, comfort, and longevity. They're the three words okay. that you should be looking Sarah's for. Sarah's up next. So Sarah is wearing this gorgeous look. Um, again, like a chunky knit polo neck, we all have in our wardrobes. Mm. And on our sloppier days, we, we might want to just put them with jeans or you know even tracksuit bottoms. But I love the idea of putting it with a printed midi because it does dress it up a little bit more and it's comfortable. Um, and with this kind of jumper, would that, you know the way sometimes you wear a jumper like that and you have to wear something because it, it's Like scratchy. a barrier. Yeah. No, it depends on the is wool content. Yeah. Yes, it's really soft. So, you know, the lower the wool content, the the softer it'll be if it's got you know it's 100% wool it is going to be scratchy and yeah. um, but you can still like that you could you could wear a little barrier top if you love it um, but no this one is a dream it is super cozy I think Sarah Did would you agree put this little belt with it yourself? yeah exactly so just to cinch in the waist because it is kind of a chunky almost sloppy oversized right so um, just and so if you're wearing a, a longer jumper fitting. as well to do that with it's great as well yeah and it? over like skinny jeans skinny leather leggings you know like there are numerous ways to wear this and the same with the midi skirt you're going to be wearing that with like a, a crepe or a cami it's unusual bag the belt yeah with it. it's brilliant is that yeah it? so this you is you can have it both ways is yes it cross, and cross it, it cross comes bag. with uh two straps actually yeah. so this is obviously the more fashion forward mm. strap and then it comes with the plain strap as well and you're so, saying this skirt with this with the split in it? Yeah, so like a really lightweight, easy wear skirt that you could dress up with a cami and a pair of heels and a blazer for Saturday night. Um, or you could wear it with a t-shirt and denim jacket in summer months. And I've just added these incredible ruched yes, leather boots, heels. Aren't they? aren't they fabulous? So they just obviously again finish off the look and that's what I love to do most is you know having the full look and feeling kind of stylish head to toe. So, like, all the looks this morning, very versatile again, yeah. wearing that skirt with something else or with, with another thing that you're wearing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, All right, and finally, our final look. Yes, so we've Heiza again, and this is 
Women are going for softer fabrics, definitely post pandemic and elastication has been key. Again, you know, yeah. I said to you before about luring us out yeah. of our loungewear. So it's the same with office wear. You don't want to feel too restricted mm. going to the office. So having these little things like the softer fabrics, this is almost a bit of a sporty feel, but it's elegant enough to get away with wearing what is to the that office. material in that top? Oh, it's just a viscose, but it's oh, called right. plisse. The way they've actually made it, it's almost like a little tiny um, pleat. Mm -hmm. But I just think it makes it look really elegant. It does, yeah. yeah it's, and, and, but it also kind of has a bit of a sweat feel to it. Yeah. Um, so then teaming it, purple definitely having a moment, whether we like it or not. Purple and pink, massive really? colour stories for autumn, winter. Yeah, so these purple... Um, but it's so different. Like if you were just wearing a black pair of trousers with that, it would just look, oh, another their outfit but yes, that yes. really makes a statement yes but also having that really easy feel the soft feel and the wider oh, leg it's so really flattering yeah. it's comfortable yeah. you don't feel like oh god and then i've just added the trainers with this one and um, just because i think you can get away so you've with dressed it. this totally down yeah, yeah yeah now you could put a pair of heels with a pair of kitten heels um but yeah i just love it with the trainers and i i'd say heisa feels super comfortable in it so super comfortable Yes. <laughs> Sarah, thank you very much for that. Some lovely looks this morning. So no now problem. we know to, to wherever our hybrid work workwear. Thank yes. you so much. Uh, Tommy and Katia, what's coming up after the break? Love it, Al. On the way in the final hour, Ali Ryan has the inside scoop on the latest showbiz news. Oh, looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, plus, from University Challenge Captain to best selling author, that's not bad going, writing writer Robin Stevens reveals why she can't stand book snobs. That's coming up after the break. Now, you may remember last week the uh, Irish dancing world. Fesh fixing. Fesh fixing. It literally caught the imagination. We had the, the Thánaiste, the yeah. minister, everybody on about it. And we've some developments, Tommy, this morning that we didn't know last week that yeah. Some of the judges are being paid a thousand euro a day plus expenses. So the Irish dancing body, the CLRG, obviously they're not a good, they don't receive any state Government funding. funding yeah. But they're sitting, so obviously they've done a deep dive into their finances, they're sitting on over two million euro uh, in their bank account it's at the surpluses moment. Surpluses every year, right? Yeah, yeah. but the, the thing is, it's all, well, the six people who are working in there, but there's actually a lot of directors and stuff, they don't get paid anything. Mm. But if you want to become an adjudicator or a dance teacher, you have to do some exams, yeah. which are which could cost you up to eight hundred euro to do all that. And the kind of it's quite opaque how you get yourself they into that. But yeah, so some of the judges, if they go to to judge a contest like at the World Irish Dancing Championships, they could be paid a thousand euro a day plus expenses on top of that. Well, it but, makes sense now when when you hear about how much it costs to be involved in Irish dancing. Yeah, well that's true yeah we have a text here that says questions need to be asked also about the cost to parents it has gone out of control dresses for 11 year olds costing 2500 euro 2, then entrance fees to fesh and it's just outrageous isn't well, it? An 11 year olds are these year -old. the parents who want that extra dress with the extra the embellishment moms, the it's like is it or, or <laughs> I, do all parents maybe some parents will let us know this morning if you're looking in is there a certain dress that you can buy and then other people will go yeah. to get the extra? Well, you did a, Irish it, dancing. Well, I did a little bit, obviously not at a professional level, but we didn't have to pay entrance fees or anything like that. But like I did do some years of stage skill and it was like parents paying for this and that. What about and that? the dresses that you had to wear to perform? Did you have to buy your own dress so for we, that? So we didn't, but you, I know the girls that would have, their parents had to, okay. you know. I mean, like, that, listen, yeah. you would imagine the top dresses would be two and a half grand, yeah. but if that's yeah. the top, you're thinking at least a thousand. Yeah, nine hundred for a dress for an eleven. Yeah. Yeah. Because my daughter's mad for Irish dancing. <laughs> oh, Does no. she want to do it? Oh, no. Does she want to yeah. do the wig and the whole well, thing? Well, I'm yeah, like it's a bit yeah. much. I think like we're, like we're always messing around the house doing <laughs> Irish dancing, <laughs> and she does ballet and all sorts of stuff. But when you hear stuff like this, yeah. like and you could see even yeah. um, my eldest goes to Irish dancing lessons twice a week and loves it. The whole scandal has really tainted it for her, and hoping that it will be resolved. That's from yeah. Lisa. Well. Yeah. Let us know because if, if your children are going to Irish dancing schools and they're going to the feshes and stuff like that, how much is it costing? So what, and what, is 2,500 the top price for a dress? dress? So, to explain to me the fixing bit, just what was it from last week? So that these judges spell, were being paid. Yeah, they were being... 
they were being bri not bribed or like even when we were saying it last week there was sexual favors being given right. to some judges to give Same. extra marks to the students. Wow. I mean, it is. It's a crazy scandal, isn't it? It's a scandal, crazy scandal. It? And it will keep rolling on. But, like, when you're hearing the fact that some, some of the judges are getting well, listen, I would, euro plus expenses... It, it, it kind of makes but sense. But if they want them to travel to the other side of the world yeah. to oh, judge, yeah. Yeah. you know, they have to get but paid everything's for paid for. Yeah. And a thousand euro a day. Hey, yeah, but if you were Tell to go to... It's nearly your money that you're getting here. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. The rest, and the rest. And the rest. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, let's All move right. on quickly. We move on. <laughs> uh, keep, uh, keep in those texts coming in about that. We'd love to hear from you. Now, what happens when a comedian and a drag queen walk into a TV studio? Well, you're going to find out after the break. <laughs> 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 now, between them, our next guests have written four books, being the subject of an award-winning film and entertained crowds from London to Leash. Leash being the most important there Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Please welcome <laughs> comedian Tara Flynn <laughs> and Rory O'Neill, also known as Panty Bliss. Good morning to you both. Great Thanks for having us. Um, so, uh, we're not going to talk about Leash. No, we won't talk about no. the, Well, let's talk about the plays. So Why wouldn't a... we talk about Leash? Well, we can. Maybe <laughs> later. <laughs> hey, London to Leash makes it sound like we only do... We only do, you know, do... <laughs> only places <laughs> beginning with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Dublin. Listen to the leash <laughs> yeah. would have sounded better. Or... <laughs> Rory, tell us. So you're on, you're, it's a double bill, like a play. You're both going to... It the... is. We both have one-woman shows. Yeah. And uh, and so we're, we're both on, in the, on the Peacock stage in the Abbey from... Yeah. Um, I'll tell you, say, November 11th <laughs> to December 3rd. There you go. Well, like a, practically a month there. You have all the opportunities. And uh, you, you can see Tara first. And uh, you can have a drink before Tara's, then you see Tara, and then there's a break, <laughs> and you can go and have a couple more drinks, and then you see mine, and you can buy a, a discounted ticket to see both of them and spend your whole night with us. Or, in the lovely Peacock Theatre. Yeah, or you can split it over two nights, but that'd cost you more if you bought two separate oh, tickets. So you can yeah. buy... And where did this idea... Because I don't think this has ever happened before, has it? Well, it's the fabulous... This is Pop Baby, who are producing our show with the Abbey Theatre, yeah. and um, Philip McMahon, who is, is directing both of our shows, uh, they had a brilliant idea to just go, why not an, a, a night of storytelling? Because both of us had shows that were bubbling up and we were writing them. They went, why don't we put the two together? Two nights of storytelling. And it's weird, some of the themes overlap and we did not consult. No, we didn't. We don't speak outside of promotional appearances. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so <laughs> we don't speak. We don't speak. So, we don't so, you like don't behind to me. Right. <laughs> so yeah, so it's, it's weird how some of the themes have overlapped. It's quite nice. Well, tell us about your play then. So mine is called Haunted, and Haunted in Cork, I don't know, and not all over Cork, but in pockets that I know, can mean really lucky. So you're ha you had a lovely day for your wedding, you're haunted. Um, Did yes, you say yeah, that? yeah, yeah. So I wanted I'm lucky. that. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing is that that there were a lot of kind of weird things that had happened in my life in the last few years, and some of them uh, took me to a very dark place. But I also wanted to focus on how lucky I've been. Mm. So it's a mix. There's a layer of all those things. It's about grief and losing my dad, um, and it's about the repeal campaign and coming out of that, and it's also about being very, very lucky. Yeah, because so the repeal, I mean, this is a really interesting story that you shared and you got really right behind that movement. Yeah, yeah, and so it really took a toll as well and although the repeal campaign itself was successful and the vote was yes, a lot of the campaigners and, and me being one of them, people who were essentially volunteers and sharing our stories, there was a cost. Was and it's time to What was the story mm. that you mentioned? You, you talked about going abroad for an abortion, yeah, wasn't it? And that yeah. really touched on you and felt it was a big part of this story. Well, well, it's the, the story I told in the last show, which was called Not A Funny Word, was the story of travelling for an abortion, okay. and uh, which touched people because there was, we all know somebody. Yeah. And uh, it was time to be honest about that. Um, whatever people's views on it are, it was time to be honest that it was happening to loads of people that people know. Right. Including someone who is, as I say, fame adjacent. You might know me, but from where? Yeah. <laughs> from sitting next to Andy Bliss on Ireland AM. But as Alan said, like you got trolled for this. Oh yeah, of badly. course. Yeah, very badly. And uh, a lot of people do when they speak out on anything. Mm. We all know that. And when you're visible, you you get trolled for for anything. But the thing is, it, I wanted to focus in this show on where that took me, but also the coming back from it. So there's lots and lots of hope. Um, and you know, there, this is a fairer country, I think, at the moment and we both talk about how things have changed and, mm -hmm. and how much hope there is. Well, Rory, obviously the change in the referendum and how yep. things have moved on for you, so your story is obviously about that or is, about, is it 
basically um, going back to the childhood in Mayo and moving it's, it's, forward. It's, 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 um, I guess the show is a bit about, you know, I'm, um, I'm not as old as you now, Alan, but I'm, 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 I'm edging, <laughs> not going I'm edging that in that way. direction. So, you know, I'm, I'm 53, you know, and, and I got into drag, you know, because it was confronting and discombobulating and punk and underground yeah. and all that, and, and young. And um, I'm none of those things really anymore. <laughs> well, I'm some of them, I hope, but, um, you know, I, I'm at the age of a time in my life, and I'm like, what the hell am I doing now? Mm. And, you know, the other drag is more popular than it ever was. Oh, totally, um, yeah. But they're all 22 and gorgeous, and, you know, lip syncing to Doja Cat, whoever the hell that is. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm just sort of, you know, at a point where I start reassessing, what the hell am I for, sort of. And at the same time, Ireland has also changed yeah. a lot, and so i like, so what's my role in this Ireland but you sort of... But and... come here, can I just sort of say to you, I mean, you are regarded when they say the Queen of Ireland. I mean, so you have that mantle and it's like yeah, you, but ha that's you weird have... Yeah, in itself. Because, Do you, you know... find that weird? Yeah, because... Do you find that, that it's a burden for you to carry that? I think it's a burden. I think it's charming and lovely in a way, but... Um, and ridiculous. And, but I like the ridiculous. But, but at the same time, I did get into all this because I was you know, wanted to be putting two fingers up to all yeah. of you lost, you know. Yeah. You know, at the time I got into drag, it was illegal to be gay in this country. Yeah. It was a criminal offence. So I was doing it out of a kind of, you know, F you, anger, um, you know, kind of thing. And can I still be, you know, at 53 years old, that, you know, fringe, underground, you know, punk, and be on the cover of the RT feckin' guide. But well, you can't <laughs> you know, really, can exactly, you? Exactly, and that's yeah. my dilemma, and the show is partly about that. Because How do you do that? How do you do that in the show? Um, by being stupid. <laughs> but, like, yeah. uh, like <laughs> from the chat we've had, you might come away with the impression that our shows are quite serious. They're, they're, they they're really have serious that. things in them. <laughs> lots of silly, lots of silly. stupid and fun and funny. Well, um, that's it, because I would like, and talk about, like, you talk about from Mayo, to the West End in London, to even in Japan. I was reading you were dancing on stage with Cindy Lauper at one stage. I mean, <laughs> it was outrageous. Yeah, oh, I did much worse than that, Tommy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, much more outrageous stuff than that. You can ask Alan later. He probably <laughs> witnessed some of it back in the day. Um, um, yeah, like, you know, I have a reckless streak. Yeah. You know, and the reckless streak has often gotten me into trouble, but it's also the thing that has often, you know, worked in my favor. Mm. Um, you know, if there's something in front of me and it looks like it might be fun to jump through it, I will jump <laughs> through it. And um, with, you know, I have no idea who's on the other side, but you know, and, and I think that is something that, you know, horrified my mother when I was a kid, but it's actually w worked out in my favor. Because Japan just came a lot where you were sort of saying, where will I go? Yeah. And you literally said there was a drag I suffered scene from, in you know, Japan. Small town boy syndrome yes. at the time. I thought that all of my troubles and all of it, yeah, everything was to do with the fact that Ireland was small and I was from a tiny, you know, town in the west of Ireland and all of that. So at the minute I was old enough to leave, I went into the ILAC library, yeah. because pre-internet, and I got out an encyclopedia and I looked up what are the biggest cities in the world. And at the time, in 1989, whatever it was, um, the two biggest cities in the world were Mexico City and Tokyo, Yokohama. And I thought, Okay. I'll go to the That's Tokyo. Because right. <laughs> you, you started a podcast as well, Marion Keys. Yeah. This is an interview you need to get on. No, I mean, I wish we did interviews. <laughs> I mean, P Panty would be certainly someone with wisdom that we could totally have on because we solve problems on Now You're Asking with yeah. Charavin and Marion Keys. And I Brandon, cause Brandon, problems. So. And you cause problems <laughs> wherever you go. That's why we don't see each other outside of promotional appearances. <laughs> um, no, but it's a lovely, fun podcast. And again, the theme of hope is there. And again, the theme of, I'm 53 as well, though I like to say I'm I'm young, uh, <laughs> but it's like it's being having that wisdom and experience, and and having a lack of wisdom and experience. So what Marion and I do is we tell our listeners, our askers, that we uh, we can't judge them because we've done far worse and are just as likely to mess up mm. again and again. So uh, it's very non-judgmental, really good crack, and it's on BBC Sounds all yeah. over the world. And of course, Marion over the years has been very open about her mental health, and you have as well, and yeah. this as well. And but as you're saying, it's all about coming through it. And, and how 
you can cope with it after. It's all about the hope that you can, because not everyone is super lucky. And, and acknowledging the fact that you have support and, and all of that, I think gratitude is something we talk about quite a lot as well. Mm -hmm. And again, that sounds quite po-faced, but I think it's really important to go, oh God, this is re we're really lucky to have a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so we do, we're all the time. We said, we recorded in Marion's front room, literally in her front room. We're in armchairs and we're just going, we're so lucky, we're so lucky. <laughs> so we, we hope that comes across in the delivery because we're just like, we're really delighted to be doing it. Uh, speaking of lucky, did you interview Graeme Norton recently about the secret yeah. cork wedding as well? And Pat, do you were, you were there as well? <laughs> I interviewed Graeme Norton last week and I asked him and I said, um, Lulu obviously didn't get the memo about <laughs> being quiet. And I said, and Panty was on the decks. And he went, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Tell us more. Uh, I mean, I didn't interview him about the <laughs> wedding because I, I, I wanted to leave his private life out of it. But I was interviewing him about his beautiful new book, Forever Home. But yeah, you were, you had the, the insights. <laughs> I, 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 I may, West Cork is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> he got the memo. And, no, 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 no. He's as, right. As, as Graeme did sort of say, they must have been all stupid if they didn't realise they were coming to a wedding. <laughs> the, that's what I would have thought if I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I had been there and had met some people who were surprised when they got there, yeah, I would if, have thought, if. what is wrong with you? <laughs> well, listen... But it was uh, a good day. Um, it's always a good day in West Cork, I, right? I, yes. Yeah. Has, has anyone ever gone to West Cork and not had a good day? No, no. Okay. secrecy. <laughs> uh, listen, Give us Abby the names theater. of the play. So mine is called Haunted. Oh, and mine is called... Um, Haunted too. <laughs> no, 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 if, we, if these wigs could talk. Oh, and if course, these wigs could talk. They're on in the Abbey Theatre. Peacock stage from November 11th until December Abbeytheatre.ie and I and the tickets are cost ah, nothing. And you get <laughs> two is it two for one? No, not quite. Not quite. How dare you? <laughs> Tara Flynn and Rory O'Neill, thank you so thank much you for coming. Thanks so much for having us. <laughs> best fella. Uh, coming up, we're going to chat to the critically acclaimed uh, children's author whose unladylike activity made her an international success. Don't See go away. Minutes. You're very welcome back. Now our next guest is the mastermind behind the best-selling books, Mur Murder Mysteries, Murder Most Unladylike. So here to talk about writing whodunits for young readers, it's author Robin Stevens. Good morning to you, Robin. Great to have you with us. Uh, you. I suppose we'll mention the new book after the success of the last one. This is the Ministry of Unladylike Activity. It What's it all about? Uh, so this book is a spy book, it's a murder mystery, it's set in World War II and it's a continuation of my Murder Most Unladylike Mysteries series. So tell us more, like yeah. what? I... What's in the book? <laughs> it's set in World War Why? II. Yeah. Yes, uh, set in World War II, um, set in 1940 in England um, in a big country house where um, there might be somebody spying for the Germans and I have three young spies, young detectives who are there to... Uh, uncover the case. It sounds like I would have loved this back <laughs> yeah. in the day, about being a the spy, spy yeah. back in the World War. Uh, it, how do you kind of get into character for these sort of things? Like, I mean, obviously, I know you like to travel for different mm -hmm. books, but obviously for this one, it would have been very difficult. I mean, this one I wrote in, in lockdown, so, you know, I was having to travel in my mind. Um, but uh, I read a lot of murder mysteries. That's that's kind of my main research. Um, I'm a huge fan of murder mystery novels, Agatha Christie, uh, Dorothy Sayers, Niall Marsh. I've been reading them uh, since I was about 12, 13. And um, yeah, I've put it to good use, <laughs> written my own. And the, the title, I love the title, The Unladylike Activity. Where did that come to you? Uh, so two places. Um, I went to Cheltenham Ladies College in England, which is really posh and really English. Um, and I was being always being told to be really ladylike uh, and right. nice. And I didn't want to be. I was like, no. And so um, Murder Most Unladylike was me trying to do the most unladylike thing I could think of and write murder mysteries. Um, but then the, the Ministry of Unladylike Activity, uh, there was a real British spy unit called uh, the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Oh. Uh, and I took that. That's, and, an, yeah. that's a title. Yes, really. I mean, it was their nickname. Right. Um, okay. They're, they're called the SOE, uh, oh, yeah. really. But um, but yeah. So that was real, a real part of history. And I thought I'm going to take that and I'm going to um, make was, it unladylike. When, when Robin was growing up, was she ever told, Robin, you're being very unladylike? All the time. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's where a lot of uh, girls can uh, relate to that yeah. one as well. <laughs> what about because you talk about with this that some adults read it, mm -hmm. but also some children as young as eight. Yes. I mean, with your previous book, Murder, most unladylike. Lady, like, was it? Uh, were you concerned maybe about having murder as the big part of a book for such young children? Um, more concerned about adult reaction. Kids, 
kids love murder mysteries. They love thinking about something really big and scary, uh, but in a very safe way. I mean, my books are sort of always solved at the end. Um, Daisy and Hazel are always safe, my two detectives. Uh, so it's done in a very safe, fun way. Mm -hmm. um, but adults do worry. I once got an email from a grandmother um, being like, uh, your books say they're for eight to 12 year olds. This must be a mistake. Please tell me you're wrong. And I had to sort of explain, no, it really was. Um, but no, it, it worries adults much more than children. Um, and I do have to explain to them that it's more, it's about solving the case. It's about seeing justice done. It's not about children being murderers. It, <laughs> it's quite the opposite. Okay, because uh, the parents like worried that the yeah. children are going to be, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, they are. But but kids are, are, are much more responsible, I think, than adults yes. give them credit for. Um, they're very smart. They they want to know this stuff and they and they love it. Oh, well, it turns out like it must be like we know how popular it was, but it looks like it could be made into TV or movies. I hope so. I'm working on it. Um, I have so many fans who are desperate to see it done, desperate to see it done right. Um, so yeah, I'm doing what I can. How and do you work hopefully. on it? What do you, how do you put? Um, so all on? I can do is just talk to different possible production companies okay. um, and see who'd be the best fit. Um, and uh, I have a clear idea of what I want. And again, I think fans really do. I've got, you know, now almost generations of fans who've, because yeah. the first book was written in 2014, published in 2014. Uh, so my first fans are at, at university or mm. young adults now, and uh, they still want to see it made, so. And listen, uh, when you see Netflix and these things, it's all about murder and murder yeah. mysteries all, as well. All, It'd be all perfect. perfect. Yeah. 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 And I mean, you were sort of saying about the way children, they're, they're so aware of things and, in your books now, you've, you're very much an advocate for the LGBTQ yeah. plus community. Yeah. And like where adults might say, oh, why are you bringing that in children? Like, I know people in school now, they're 10, 11, they've trans people in their yeah. classes and stuff, and they're so open to that. And you you have yeah. put that into your books. I, I think it's really important to, to write about that stuff because, because it's, you know, the world is diverse, really. Mm. Children, you know, will have, you know, a queer and trans parents, they'll, mm. they'll have queer and trans friends, they, you know, they understand their identities much earlier than, than adults want to think that. There is nothing sort of intrinsically adult about, um, you know, being LGBTQ. Um, again, it's just adult fears. And I think a lot of those fears are that for a long time it was something that, that couldn't be spoken about, that, that was sort of, you know, pushed aside and hidden. And, and so we adults now think of it as something adult, but it's not, you know, it's something mm. that children are are surrounded by every day and it's so important for them to see that and to see positive role models of of sort of queer and trans people and daisy in my in my first series is um is lesbian mm. she comes out in uh the book death in the spotlight and i've had so much reaction from from kids um, and it's so Pos positive they mm. love it um i remember just the the tour i did after that i i came to ireland did some um events and and signings and you know, kids are com coming up to me in the line and thanking me and saying, I love this, I can see myself in Daisy. And that is just, wow. that's what it does. It's so important. And, and it, they can maybe talk to their yeah. parents about that because they've yes. read it in the book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I tried to do it in a really age-appropriate um, and positive and, and lovely way, and I and I am really pleased with how it sort of turned out. I mean, it's such an inspiration for that, for mm. young people yeah. to reach out to you as well. You're, of course, a bit of an inspiration because you were a captain on University Challenge as well, going back a few years ago against Jeremy Paxman. Uh, how, how was that? Uh, I was much younger than I am now, and I was very nervous, and I remember just shaking under the desk, <laughs> shaking my hands, shaking yeah. as, we, as I was answering questions. But... Um, an amazing experience in retrospect. I think now I've gotten over it, <laughs> sort of 15 years later. Um, but yeah, but it was... what is it like when you're going in there? Because, like, for you, it must be so daunting. It was. It really was. You know, you're you're 19 years old. You're there for your whole university. You know, everyone's watching you. You know, your your parents are watching you. I grew up watching University Challenge, and um, I love you know answering questions and sort of having all that knowledge. Um, and it felt like sort of the, the big moment of my life. <laughs> we got to the second round and we're knocked out. But um, you oh, know, we're now still I'm talking proud. about. Yeah, we are. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> my That's amazing. Fair play. No, I think it's great now. Um, I'm really proud of myself. Robin, thank you so much. We're loving your shoes Thank by the you. way I love the shoes. Shoes. they are absolutely fantastic thank you so much for coming Thank in you. and good luck with the book Thank the you so ministry much. of unladylike yes. activity yeah. and there we go. the ministry of unladylike activity is available in all good bookshops and online now plus robin will be doing a signing you're in waterstones in cork city on wednesday at 4 p.m. No tickets no. needed, so you've got lots Please of people. Come along, yeah. Just come along and say hello yes. and sign the book. That'd be wonderful, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Much. It's great to have you with thank us you. now. Katya, what's coming up next? We have my favourite coming up after the break. Goss Studies, Ali Ryan is here with a showbiz roundup.
Now, who doesn't love a bit of showbiz gossip of a Monday morning? Ali Ryan from Goss.ie is here to give us the scoop on all the latest showbiz. Good morning to you, Ali. Good morning. And we do love a bit of goss on a Monday morning. Always. What's been happening at the weekend? And we're starting with Megan Fox and Machine Gun Kelly spotted shopping in shopping. Temple Bar. Like, I know. What? I love when we see celebs like going for a pint of milk or shopping in Dublin. We're like, things. what? Yeah. <laughs> they go shopping? This is a really good story, though, because they popped into a vintage store called Nine Crows in Temple Bar, which is actually quite well known, but it's really cool for them, I think, to get this notoriety now. So apparently the store, uh, one of the people that were on the shift at the time were playing a Machine Gun Kelly song because he's actually playing this week Who in Dublin. Who is Machine Gun Kelly? You're asking if Machine Gun Kelly is <laughs> her boyfriend, right? He's a punk rock star. He used to be a rapper, right? Yeah. yeah. So Machine okay. Gun Kelly and Megan Fox are like this new it couple on par with Travis Barker and Kourtney Kardashian. We all get oh, the two okay. of them confused a lot. But he's basically very cool. That's why I don't know much better myself. But he was walking past, <laughs> saw, heard the music, went in, and everyone was like, oh, Megan Fox. Because I think to Irish people, Megan Fox is the more famous oh, person. Yeah. So yeah. everyone was like, oh my God. And they were really nice. They took photos with the store manager. They took photos with everyone. They didn't ask for a discount which I love. They spent about 200 euro. They were chatting away. Because sometimes when celebrities come to Dublin, like it's happened before, like Justin Bieber, you see it with Kim Kardashian, when she's even in London, they shut stores down. down. Yeah. yeah, and expect free things. They expect free yeah. things. They don't want to be bothered. They were posing in the clothes. Mm. They were posing with fans that were walking by. Very chill. And then Machine Gun Kelly actually gave some tickets to people in the stores yeah. off, which yeah. is really, really he was nice. playing yesterday. So, oh. And I know two of the girls in the picture, so I feel like I've one degree separation away from yeah. Megan Fox now. <laughs> but he they did give tickets. them free tickets. <laughs> Yeah. Obviously, the show wasn't selling. No, I don't think so. <laughs> You're they were like doing you. them a favour. <laughs> <laughs> and what else now? We have Goss on Brad and Angelina. What's going down yeah. with them now? Oh, it's always chaotic with them. It's crazy to think yeah. that they actually filed for divorce in 2016 because this has been the longest, drawn-out, dramatic separation I think we've ever seen in Hollywood. And that says a lot. So basically, there's a lot of different things going on in the internet at the moment, right? Because people were giving out this weekend that Angelina Jolie has brought up the plane incident from 2016 mm. again. So there was an alleged incident where Brad had apparently had a bit of an altercation with his kids. That's all we knew at the time. The FBI had investigated. They did not pursue yeah. any mm -hmm. criminal charges. Mm -hmm. But they also bought a winery in France together, as you do when you're a celeb couple. <laughs> and Angie was meant to sell the actual rights to Brad so that he could get rid of it, but he want, his team wanted her to sign an NDA saying that she would never talk about the plane incident again in order to get the sale. She refused, so in the court documents she had to explain what it what was happened? he was trying to protect, and in that she went a little bit further and talked. She alleged that he choked, tried to choke on the children, poured drink on them. So there's a lot of people giving out online, calling her Amber Heard 2.0, which is very dangerous. Well, I think she's just defending her kids right? because her son doesn't speak to Brad at all, and that's probably mm. why. And he has not been seen with them in yeah. about five years in terms of photographs or anything like that. So there's a lot of PR spin going on. His team came out and basically gave out about Angelina bringing this up, saying that she's trying to put him in a bad light. So there's a, it's just a really typical Hollywood back and forth with a couple, but it's just the details are so could, shocking. Could we see a Johnny Depp situation here where now this might affect Brad Pitt's career? Yeah, see, I feel like it might be going that way. The fact that his team are saying she's basically trying to ruin my reputation. But I mean, there is documents from the FBI, they did genuinely investigate this. Yeah. Now, they didn't and they do didn't anything. Press they didn't press I charges. Don't, I don't think this will hurt his career. He had bullet train, right? That was just out this year. Yeah. He's doing quite well. So, and he's a man in Hollywood. He's a man in Hollywood, I know. But yeah, his... bullet train was out, I think, a little bit before the, the, news, the news dropped yeah. as yeah. such. But his, yeah, his team are basically trying to say, you know, he's a movie coming out and why is this coming up? But we have to yeah. remember at the end of the day, it's Brad doing a counter suit. That's where yeah. this is all coming mm. from. So she's not randomly deciding to bring it back up. He's counter suing. He wants the NDA, he wants the winery, so it's actually t technically coming from his side, but it's very, very ugly, and I don't think this is the end of it. No, I think there's I, a lot I, more to come. It's not going to be good for anybody. No. Uh, Dancing on Ice will be coming to Virgin Media Television very soon, and well, in the new year, in the start of the new year. Yes. And they've been announcing over the weeks, they've been announcing who's going to be taking part. Some big names. Yeah, Eck and Sue from Love Island. I mean, honestly, her, if she's just on the show by herself, I think everybody's going to watch it. <laughs> the rates will be on an all-time Yeah, people just But it's a pity David is not there as well. So apparently, You're a liar. 
Oh, you're a liar. Oh, look at them. <laughs> a liar, an actress. I love him. I actually miss seeing her on our screens. I know. So, good news, though. Davide and Ekin have a show together that they're making the for travel ITV. travel show, yeah. So, they've already started filming it. If you follow her on Instagram, she's already been in Rome, prancing around the place, looking amazing. But Davide apparently was asked to do Dancing on Ice first, and he Ooh. said no, and then Ekin did it. So, I, I don't know if he said no. I don't, maybe he wanted his queen to do it instead. Oh. So I think she's going to be amazing. And you have to remember, Maura Hakens was one of the first Love Island stars to come straight out of Love Island and go straight on to Dancing on Ice. And she did so well. So I think bosses in there were like, right, let's get Ekin in. Yeah. She's still the talk of the town. She's going to be one of the richest, most successful Love Island stars in history. Ever, yeah. She already has an Opali deal. She's a Be Perfect deal. There's more and more deals coming as well. And I think their show is going to launch. So I'll even you're saying, you yeah. miss them. Like, oh, I miss sir. them. People want to see yeah. them again. You but need to get out more, dear. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a good mix on this year. So we have my Joey, girl Ekin. <laughs> Joey Essex as well. Um, the oh, only love a bit of Joe. Who doesn't line. love a bit of Joey Essex? I know. He's going to be fab on it. I know. And he's done pretty much every reality show I can think of, and I'm still not sick of him. No. I'm like, bring him on. Yeah. I don't care. I love him. Um, so a lot of people recognize him. And then we have the Vivian, so drag queen and TV personality. Um, I think this is great because this is the first time a drag artist has been, has been asked to do one of these mainstream yeah. shows. Yeah, I cannot wait for the costumes. Yeah. Like, yeah. everyone else is going to mm. be fuming because it's just going to look amazing. But I think she will probably do, like, the best. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, they just, the performance, everything. So, I know, but yeah. when you put on a pair of skates, that's a different story. It all goes downhill. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Uh, then we have Molly Gallagher as well from Coronation Street. She's oh, going to yeah. be on. the young goth one, yeah. Yeah, the goth one. Yeah, isn't that what she is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, she plays, I think, Nina is her name on the show. Then we have gymnast Niall Wilson. Don't know any gymnasts now myself. But, um, <laughs> there he is there. Who we definitely will recognise, well, I will anyway, maybe showing my age a bit, is Patsy Palmer. So she used to play Patsy Bianca, Bianca on EastEnders. She's oh, also a yeah. DJ now. That's her new job. She? She's an actual DJ. That's her job. Does she still wear the silver I love, puffer? Still the best line ever in EastEnders. <laughs> You're not my mother. Oh, yes, <laughs> I am. <laughs> I loved Bianca. But Love I think Bianca. I think with rally TV shows, a lot of the people who win or get to the end are the really nice personalities. And I feel like Ekin and Patsy, they might be the two. Yeah. I know they all also have to dance, but a lot of people get kept in because they're genuinely nice people yeah. and they yeah. get on with everyone. So they're my two favourites, I think. Do you think it's season. a stronger lineup than Strictly this year? Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe oh, Ek and Sue. I tried to well, say Ek and Sue's actually coming in to do Dancing on Ice. Yeah. Yes. That's Why amazing. She? Well, I kind of think she's like with that new show, I thought it was going to be like a step because she could make a right fool of herself on the ice. Well, she could. But fairness. I think she'd be also the but one to laugh at herself. She's getting paid. Exactly. She's, and she's, she's paid. definitely they been paid the most yeah, out of anyone who's been on and, the lineup. And yeah. I think Dancing on Ice is known they, they pay the most money of all the reality And you have to remember, this shows. time oh, really? of year, it's, you know, you have Strictly, I'm a Celeb, everyone's trying to get someone like Ek, yeah. so there would have been a bidding war to oh. even get her to a show. Yeah, so you'd fall yeah. on your ass on the ice if you get that Collins, didn't she fall backwards as well? Yeah. And there was like a meme about her. Collins. sorry for her. And there was so much drama with her being on the show. Apparently she didn't turn up on time. Remember behind the scenes, Holly will be able to come out and talk about it. So I don't think oh, we'll have that with Ekin. She's really nice and I think she's going to be so grateful just to be there. Yeah, and Sue's great. Ali, as always, thank you very thank much you. for that. <laughs> now, coming up on Tuesday's Ireland EM Impression King, Oliver Callan drops by for a talk or for talk killing leprechauns. I don't know, he was slagging me off there recently <laughs> as well. Plus, from centers to the bill, actor Todd Carty gives us an inside scoop on his latest role. And they've sold over 22 million albums worldwide. Foster and Alan are dropping by. Had wow. a bunch Bunch of time. <laughs> <laughs> All that for your usual news point. Whether you're waking up to Ireland M is back live from seven. Have, you, have a great day. Well done, Katia. Day one. Day one. Well done. Well done. Well done. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. <laughs> bye bye.